Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Helen Bernstein. I'm Council Program Development in the Department of Professional Development and Competence at the Law Society. Uh, we're happy to welcome you to today's Law Society Interactive Learning Network program, Electronic Registration and Title Searching for Law Clerks. We want to welcome everybody attending in the lecture hall in Toronto, as well as those watching from our Learning Network locations, which you've probably seen scrolling by on the screen. And all those people are in Barrie, Brantford, Kenora, Kingston, Hamilton, London, Niagara on the Lake, North Bay, Perry Sound, Peterborough, Sault Ste. Marie, Sioux Lookout, Sudbury, Thunder Bay, Waterloo, Windsor. So you'll be seeing those people asking questions during the question period uh, that's part of the panel at the end of the program. Uh, I just want to explain a few things about the question period. Um, during the panel at the end of the program, when we are taking questions from Toronto and all those locations, we'll roll through all those locations first and then take questions from Toronto. If you're in one of our ILN locations, we ask you to choose someone in the group to respond during the Q&A and that they sit where we can, be, we can see you by, with our camera. As well, if you're asking a question from one of those locations, please respond with your location name so we can make sure we don't miss anybody. If you're in Toronto, we'll ask you to please put your question on a question sheet that's in your binder, and one of our Lost Society representatives will pick it up um, and make sure the presenters see it. Presenters in Toronto will ask you to repeat the question for the benefit of everybody listening along the network. As we embark down our new interactive learning road, it's more important than ever that everyone try and complete the great course evaluation forms that are in the binder because we want to know your thoughts about the program as well as about our new interactive delivery mode. Please note that we are videotaping this program as well. Finally, I want to thank the chairs, Sylvana Del Monte and Rosemary Grenside, both experienced real estate practitioners. Uh, Rosemary's with Osler Hoskin and Harcourt and Sylvana is with Blake's. Um, I also want to thank my associate Katerina Galati for all her help with the program, as well as the help of all the presenters. I know you're in for a very interested, interesting morning. I'm pleased to turn the podium over to Sylvana. Thanks, Helen. It's, it's amazing, this program you've put together and the number of people who've turned out. It's, it's really wonderful. My co-chair, Rosemary Grenside, and I would also like to welcome you today, both those of you in Toronto and those in our remote locations. We're delighted so many of you have chosen to attend and look forward to providing you with an informative and we believe useful program today. Now the genesis of this program is interesting. I chaired the second annual Real Estate for Law Clerks program in October of last year and I can already see from the faces some of you attended that program. I had taken advantage of Rosemary's good nature at that time and had asked her to moderate an EREG question and answer panel, but EREG was only a component of that program. After the program though, it became clear from comments and questions from the audience that there was a need and a desire for a more advanced, in-depth program dealing solely with electronic registration, and hence the program today. Now, I personally feel, and I know Rosemary feels the same, that these programs for law clerks are essential. I know I can't do what I do without the very able assistance of law clerks in my office. Although I've been interested in electronic registration from the beginning, I still rely on one of our senior law clerks to educate me on the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts, the practical aspects of eReg. And I suspect many of you perform that role in your offices. Accordingly, we want to share as much information with you as possible, while also giving you an opportunity in the question and answer session at the end of the program to tell us about your experiences, your problems, issues, potential solutions, etc. So now I'd like to turn it over to Rosemary Grenside, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Silvana. 
Um, in no way do Sylvain and I want to uh, or intend to minimize uh, the incredible accomplishments of many of our speakers. Uh, their uh, biographies are in uh, your notes. So we're going to focus on uh, the work that they do that relates to EREG. Our first speaker is Randy uh, Reese. Uh, he's currently the project manager of the Electronic Land Registration with the Ministry of Consumer and Business Services. Uh, Randy's prior experience was with PPSA and the conversion uh, from the paper system there uh, to the electronic, and uh, so Randy uh, is very informative in uh, um, the electronic environment. Uh, Randy has been involved uh, with a number of groups, uh, law firm groups and so on, in assisting us in trying to grapple with all the many problems, and uh, so without anything further, I uh, turn it over to Randy. Thank you, Rosemary. And hopefully, you've got handouts in there, I'm sure, with uh, my presentation, but it it's also hopefully coming up on a screen somewhere. Anyway, <coughs> that away from here. That's good feedback. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's not nice to see such a, a large turnout. I think the last time I was here, we did a, a CLE session with lawyers about two years ago, and it was equally well attended. The presentation I'm about to do has changed a bit over the past three years, and it's hard to believe we've been at this for three years, but usually I go a little more detail about what electronic registration is, but I'm not sure that would be very uh, valuable today because I think most of you have probably uh, used the system, at least the people where it's available. And my apologies for those in other locations where eReg may not be available yet, but uh, I can promise you it's coming. A little bit of background first on, uh, on our system. We started automation way back in the early 1980s, so we've been at this about 20 years now in the automation process is not yet complete. Uh, I think we're probably in the 70 odd percentile range, but we're looking to have the province basically fully automated by about 2006 and 7. It's, it's been a, a very long journey uh, and a somewhat difficult one over the years. Part of the automation process, as you're probably aware, is converting registry properties to land titles. And that was required for electronic service, electronic uh, registration. We've done, and the, pro the number keeps going up, we're at about 4.7 million properties now in Ontario. We've got about 3.6 million that have been automated. So the process continues and it seems like every time an inventory is taken, uh, the number of properties uh, continues to increase. You can't do electronic registration without properties being automated and converted into the land title system. So all the work that's been done uh, in the past few years has really been setting the stage for electronic, uh, not only electronic access to the records, but also electronic registration. And as I mentioned before, we should be substantially complete with this project by about 2006-07. And that's both on the uh, automation conversion side and on the electronic registration side. A little bit of a brief background on eReg. Uh, the framework for it was set with legislation in 1994. That was kind of all-encompassing legislation that the government passed, allowing other programs to do electronic registration, and uh, in my days in personal property, we were really the first to take advantage of that. Uh, but now we're into land registration. The development of the system began way back in 1995, and there was an awful lot of consultation. I've been with the program since about 1999, so it started well before my time. But there were a lot of consultation that took place with a number of stakeholders, and certainly the Law Society was one of the, the key ones. Uh, those user groups, and there have been a number of them that have been formed since those early days, continue to meet and as this uh, practice continues to evolve. A joint committee was set up uh, among the uh, Law Society of Upper Canada, Canadian Bar Association, to review existing practice standards and how they would work with uh, electronic registration. Those standards, I think, are still evolving. The Law Society has since put out a publication that's available on their website. I'm sure most of you have probably seen it. At least, if uh, I hope you have. If you haven't, it's available on their uh, on their website. As I mentioned, that group uh, continues to meet and continues to deal with some of the existing practice issues. Some of the key concepts, and again, very high level here. It applies to land titles only. Registry documents must continue to be submitted in paper form. Uh, we can't do electronic registration of registry documents. Documents no longer have to be manually signed. It's digital signatures. For those of you who have the software, and I assume most people here, at least in Toronto, have used it, you know what the digital signature is and how, it's, uh, how, it, how it works. The documents are purely in electronic form. You don't need any paper in this system to have legal effect on title. 
It's the electronic document that does that. One of the key benefits from this, obviously, is you no longer have to attend at the registry office. So you're no longer tethered to an office. You can do work in virtually any office around the province where electronic registration is available. And I think that's one of the key advantages and the things, one of the things that people find most advantageous. The electronic document, this is part of the legislation, it prevails over any former copy of the document that may be in written form. So it's actually electronic record, as I mentioned, that has the legal effect on title. And what this system does is make enhanced use of statements as opposed to evidence. And uh, I think that's probably where a lot of people are having problems wrestling with the statements and, and, and the lack of evidence that we require. Uh, I guess probably a good example is a survivorship. We used to require proof of death and see the will and whatnot. Now you make a statement, we no longer require that documentation. We don't need to look at it. We rely on the statement that's been made by people submitting the document. And that, of course, gets us out of the paper storage business, which we've been in for about 200 years. Uh, and we're trying to get out of that because there's an awful lot of papers floating around. Implementation of this. We're doing it on a county by county basis, region by region, whatever it is. It's been going since about 1999 now in Middlesex, which was the pilot site. But we really only got going on this in any big way when we went with a, a mandatory uh, regulation in Middlesex in, I think it was March 2000. So we've been at it about three years now. How we do this is we'll go into a jurisdiction, we do them one at a time. Uh, we'll make a, a file a regulation that basically says you have the option of submitting documents electronically. It's the optional phase. We then file a second reg uh, that makes it mandatory. You must uh, file electronically. There's a minimum of 60 days between those two regs. That was a, a recommendation from the Law Society. Uh, we've never met that 60 days. It's always been considerably longer, although we're starting to, to close that window. But what it does is give people an opportunity to move from the paper environment and start doing files electronically before they actually have to. We've always made the announcement, we'll continue to do that, that any documents you have that may be executed prior to second regulation, you can continue to file in paper. It's funny that three years later in London we still see the odd one that was executed before March something. But anyway, they're slowly getting weeded out of the system. Three options for filing electronically. The first one is to do it remotely using software, and that's certainly the preferred method. That's the one where you're going to find you get all the advantages of, of, of filing electronically. The second one, in every e-reg office, we have a kiosk, or kiosk as the case may be, depending on size. Uh, you may sit down. It's simply a PC, but you must be a, a registered TerraView user and have the property security credentials to use it, but it's basically a PC with TerraView on it uh, that you can go to the office and, and use. The third one is what we call staff assisted. Uh, that was intended and is intended for that one-time user that wants to come in and needs some assistance of some kind, uh, like somebody maybe discharging their mortgage. It is not intended for the regular user. We've made this statement, I guess, ever since the beginning, and thankfully everyone's listened to it. Uh, we've always said that if you try to use that option to do business, you're not going to be very successful because, quite frankly, it takes way too long. We're simply, we would be uh, in the business of transcribing data for you and creating the document. So we discourage people from using that, and like I said, everyone's listened, so that's great. And majority use is certainly coming from people with the software on their desktop and using it remotely. I've already mentioned about uh, London being the pilot site. It goes back to 99. We actually had, we're, on, we're awful proud of saying this is the world's first. There is no other jurisdiction in the world that has done electronic land registration anywhere. Uh, we were the first to do it. We get an awful lot of interest from around the world on this. Uh, I often speak to delegations from various countries. I think in the past year, probably upwards of a dozen or more. So there's an awful lot of interest in this system worldwide and what we've done in Ontario. An awful lot of uh, people are coming here to see about it. I mentioned the user groups. Uh, we've got user groups from financial institutions, from municipalities, from various jurisdictions around. There's some fairly large, uh, large user groups, and I know there's a big one in Ottawa. Uh, so they continue to meet, and we continue to participate in those user groups. Uh, and I think they've been extremely useful in terms of uh, moving eReg forward and making it as successful as it has been. Since our early days in London, we've gone through three versions of the software. Uh, soon to be four. Uh, and most of those versions are there and have come out because of feedback we've gotten from clients like yourself who've used it and said this doesn't work well or that doesn't work well or maybe we need this. So we'll continue to improve the software. I think that's just a process that goes on with any software product. We'll continue to make it look better. 
As of April today, we are now in 18 jurisdictions across the province. Um, we've moved pretty fast from uh, in the past year to the first uh, year or so we went through, I think the normal growing pains is something that was so radically different. But since then, things have certainly settled down and we've gone pretty fast. Uh, basically every month we're going into one or two new jurisdictions. You'll see a map up there. The, the reddish ones are where mandatory, uh, the kind of purplish or bluey ones are were still an optional phase. Needless to say, Toronto's surrounded and all the big population centers, but certainly that's where we go first. I mean, you pick off the biggest ones first, so you get the, the biggest bang for this. Uh, we've certainly gone into all the largest jurisdictions in the province. Uh, we just went into Windsor last month, and that was one of the few, what I'd call large uh, jurisdictions that are left. I put uh, some information in your handouts for you. We sometimes get asked for this. Uh, I'm not going to go through these. The next table is really the availability of e-reg. It shows you the 18 jurisdictions when the regs were filed, uh, both first and second. And obviously, there's a, a few there where there is no second reg, but it's for information purposes for you. We now have over 1.3, probably closer to 1.4 million documents have been registered electronically. I mean, if I look back in the first year in London, to give you some idea, we did, I think, around 1,200 in the whole year in the optional phase in London. When we went to Toronto in the optional phase, we did double that in the first week. So getting out of London wasn't that easy, but once we did and things started improving, it's, it's gone very fast in the last couple of years. Uh, we will do this year, I think we're up to around 64% of all the registrations in the province are now filed electronically. If you go back, I think I've got a chart in here later. If you go back about two years ago, that was probably under 10%. So in the last two years, things have moved very, very fast. Uh, we're going to continuing to get, a, I, I guess, just a, a flurry of documents each month that come in, and that's going to continue to grow. 98% uh, of documents in mandatory jurisdictions come in electronically, remotely. There's uh, the other 2% account for either on-site or paper. Uh, but certainly it's, uh, it's been very successful in those jurisdictions. I mentioned no one's using staff assisted. That's great because it wasn't intended for the regular users. It's less than one half of 1%. In most jurisdictions, sometimes it's even less. We can take an office like Whitby and we may get four or five there a month. If you look back, I guess in the early days in London, we had uptake between first and second reg as we watched this thing evolve at about 5%. That was it. So by the time we were going into second reg, 5% of the documents in London were coming in electronically. We're now in Toronto and other first reg jurisdictions, and Toronto's not mandatory yet because we haven't finished automation. But looking at the numbers last month, and we're still in the first reg environment, 81% of the documents in Toronto are now coming in electronically. So you can see the huge acceptance that's gone on between, say, when we were in Middlesex and where we are in Toronto now. Even some of the other jurisdictions in first reg, like in Stratford, uh, which is, I guess, here under Perth, one of them, I forget. It's about 71%, and they're still in the optional phase. So people are embracing this much, much sooner than they did in the early days. We've got a new version of the software that's coming out sometime soon. Uh, we've just gone through a lot of testing uh, on this uh, version of it, and it should be ready for release fairly soon. Some of the key features, uh, lease type documents. This is one something that a lot of people want. It's currently a two-party document. Uh, now it's a one-party document, or can be a one-party document. So I think that's going to satisfy uh, the needs of um, a lot of clients, land transfer tax affidavit uh, will now be able to be to come from the party from instead of the party to. And there'll also be viewing of our plans available in this release. I mentioned the 64%, I won't go over that. Um, system uptime's always been a concern. What if this system crashes? What if it goes down? What happens on a busy day uh, when the system isn't available? Uh, we haven't really had a significant outage probably in almost two years. Uh, I know there was a time a couple years ago when we had uh, a few problems uh, with a couple of months at month's end, but we've never had a time where the system hasn't been available during a whole day. I think our maximum outage was about four hours, and then I'm going back two years ago. The other thing people worry about is capacity. How's this thing going to work on busy, busy days, and are we going to be able to, the system be able to cope with it? Can we get on? Can we get registered? Uh, we constantly, and I say we, I'm talking about Terranet, uh, constantly monitor uh, the system and, and how it's performing and the capacity in it and if required you just always add more resources. We had our highest day at the end of November when we did over 11,000 electronic registrations that one day. 
And if you look at the last couple hours, I think between three and five, they were coming in a little over 2,000 an hour at that point. And at one point that day, there were over 1,000 concurrent users on the system. And looking at the uh, network performance that day, it was nowhere near capacity. So I don't want people to be concerned about that. Capacity should never really be an issue with this. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens when we get to June this year, when we get to, <laughs> we get a lot more registrations probably than uh, the 11,000 we had on that one day. I showed you this, or at least I talked about this chart, and as you can see how the uptake uh, has gone in terms of our overall volume uh, from way back around 5% two years ago to up to 64% now of the total volume in the province, and that's just going to continue to, uh, to increase, although I would imagine that graph is going to start to flatten out a bit because now we're basically just going into smaller jurisdictions. Put a schedule here for you for this year. This is where we're going this year, where we've been, at least in Windsor, it's already done. Uh, we've gone with first reg there. We're going to go back with second reg in September. Here on Perth, Lanark, Renfrew, Russell are already in first reg. Uh, but second regs there will be going here on in Perth uh, next month. Lanark, Renfrew, and Russell the month after. Niagara North and South will go first reg there in July. We've yet to schedule a second reg date. Waterloo will go in November of this year and mandatory will go in February. Toronto's already there and there's a typo here, folks. I thought I'd check this thing a hundred times and didn't miss anything, but I checked it one more time yesterday and I did. It's December 2003 for Toronto, not 2004. Okay. So it's coming this year. And we should, uh, like I said, the only thing that's holding Toronto up is really we have to finish the automation and uh, that should be finished by then. Some of the issues coming out of this, again, I'll, I'll talk of these at some of a, a fairly high level. We're getting, quite frankly, just too many requests for documents to be returned. And some of the main reasons are it's the wrong document type. People perhaps aren't doing sub-searches. People are just making errors. And I think what happens a lot is people generally don't look at the document they've registered until after they've registered and the printout comes. And there's something in the software called Doc and Prep. You can print out a copy of that before you register it. Uh, I would suggest that you do so because uh, you'll avoid a lot of these errors and avoid a lot of the, the headaches that we get in having to, re uh, to deal with them. Some of the documents, part of the process, if you know, if you've dealt with it, if we find a problem when we're certifying title, we will send the document back to you electronically. Uh, we always call first before and tell the, the party that the document's coming back, uh, basically tell you what's wrong, needs to be corrected. We would expect to get that document back fairly quickly. In most cases we do, but in a number of cases we don't. And sometimes we're making four, five, six, ten phone calls. I can look out the printout at sometimes and still see documents that are six months old that have been sent back and people for whatever reason aren't returning them. So please, when you get the phone call and when you get the document back, which you're notified of when you sign on through a message, to make that correction and get it back so we can certify it. And people know the problems with title if documents aren't certified and things back up. Also, there's a lot of reliance on LRO staff to kind of, I don't want to say do the work, but we get an awful lot of questions that uh, we probably shouldn't be answering. It's, it's not our job to answer questions uh, of the nature around uh, some of the legal issues. We have a help center. We get about 3,500 calls a day through that, uh, and that's through a 1-800 number that we share with Ternet. Um, that's just the number of calls to that number. It's not including the number of calls we get directly to the land registry office. So it can, um, did I say 3,500 a day? I'm sorry, I said 3,500 a month. I can't read. Huh. Good thing I caught that. 3,500 a month, and it's probably doubled if you look, um, if you look at, I'm glad I caught it, nobody else did, but. Um, anyway, you know, we would also expect our call volumes to start to go down as people get more comfortable and used to the system. Uh, we're not really finding that's the case, at least we haven't seen that yet, so we would hope to. There is, um, I know I've got probably about one minute left. I'm not going to go through the common client errors. They're there for your information uh, to have a look at them. Um, I put another slide in here because we often get the questions, what can we still register in paper? There's a list of documents there that can, can continue to be registered in paper for a variety of reasons. They make up a very, very small percentage of, of what we do. Like I said, probably one to two percent max, depending on the office. And there are some document types. There's been some issues around powers of attorney and whatnot. There are some document types that will that will accept both in registry or electronically and uh, in paper. My last slide before I'm kicked out. Um, if you do need help, there is a call center, 1-800 number. 
Now there's a local number in Toronto. There's three options on there, one to talk to Terranet if you're having software problems. You press two, you go to the Ministry Help Desk, which is uh, answered by about four different registry offices, although you won't know which office you're talking to. Um, it's, it's answered there, and there's a third option that actually takes you to the Ministry of Finance to deal with land transfer tax issues. We have a website, you can go there, there's uh, all the bulletins and whatnot are there and memos that have come out from the director of titles over the years. A lot of useful information there that will help you. And I've also provided phone numbers for the, uh, for the 18 offices uh, that are there currently. So thank you for your time. I will turn it back over to Rosemary, thanks. Thanks very much, Randy. You know, he's gonna miss our calls when we become proficient at this system. <laughs> Thanks very much. The ministry has always been excellent. They really have right from the beginning at working with user groups and trying to modify the system to make it work better for us. So that's always been great throughout. I'd like to introduce our next speaker now, Katerina Galati. Katerina is the counsel with the Professional Development and Competence Department of the Law Society of Upper Canada, with whom she's worked since March of 2000. She's also an advisor member of the Law Society OBA Joint Committee on Electronic Registration of Title Documents. As well, Katerina played an important role in shaping the program today, for which we thank her. And she's always available to talk to us about Law Society stuff to keep us on the straight and narrow. So thank you, Katerina. Thank you. I'm going to be speaking today about some of the regulatory changes that uh, we've had to make to deal with electronic registration. For those of you who attended the program, uh, the real estate law clerk program earlier uh, this year, I apologize if I'm going to be repetitive, but we thought the, uh, the topic was important enough to, to repeat in, in this program. I'm going to cover three topics. One is the amendments that have been made to the rules of professional conduct to deal with electronic registration. Secondly, the six practice guidelines that have been developed and approved by convocation. And thirdly, and this comes largely from my experience in dealing with the calls from the profession, um, some of the ways that I think that lawyers and law clerks can make things easier for themselves when closing uh, electronic registration transactions. Before I actually start with the rules, though, I'd like to define some of the terminology that I'm going to be using. The rules of professional conduct, they govern the conduct of lawyers in Ontario, which probably everybody knows. They contain the ethical standards that lawyers must adhere to. The rules are expressed in the form of rules and they're followed by commentaries. The rules portion of the rules are mandatory. They constitute the duties that the lawyer must fulfill. If a lawyer breaches a rule, there could be a finding of professional misconduct and the lawyer could be disciplined. The commentaries that follow the rules, their purpose is to explain the rule. They assist lawyers in interpreting the rule. The language used is explanatory and advisory. Usually you'll see the word should in the commentaries. So let me turn to the amendments that were made to the rules. In June of the year 2002, last year, convocation on the recommendation of the Law Society uh, and OBA Joint Committee for the Electronic Registration of Title Documents approved two new sub-rules and four commentaries. The sub-rules. Um, additions were made to the delegation rule or the rule that deals with the supervision uh, by lawyers of non-lawyers. Subrules 5.017 and 5.018 were added to the Rules of Professional Conduct. And they both uh, generally deal with the prohibition on sharing of the PSP, the personal security package, that is the diskette and pass phrase that are used to access the EREG system. The first rule, subrule 5.017, basically prohibits a lawyer from sharing his or her PSP that is, sharing the diskette or revealing his or her passphrase. The second subrule, 5.018, imposes obligations on the lawyer regarding non-lawyer employees who have PSPs. The lawyer must ensure that the non-lawyer's employees do not permit others to use their diskettes and passphrases. The commentary that follows these subrules explains the reasoning behind the rule. One is that the audit trail can be maintained 
the commentary states, the integrity and security of the system is achieved in part by its maintaining a record of those using the system for transactions. The second reason, only lawyers entitled to practice law may make compliance with law statements. In addition to this commentary, there are three other new commentaries. Five point, sub rule 5.012, the uh, sub rule that deals with delegation of tasks to non-lawyers, contains the statement that only a lawyer may sign for completeness any document that contains a compliance with law statement. In addition to that, there's an addition to sub rule 5.013, another delegation rule, and it basically states that a lawyer who approves the electronic registration of documents by a non-lawyer is responsible for the content of that document. And the final rule, and an important one, the final commentary added to, to uh, a rule, and the final one, and probably one of the most important ones, is the addition to sub rule 6.038, the undertaking rule. The undertaking rule provides that a lawyer shall not give an undertaking that cannot be fulfilled and shall fulfill every undertaking given. The commentary reminds lawyers that when they enter into DRAs, they are giving undertakings and they must fulfill their obligations under the rule. And those are the amendments to the rules. Now the guidelines, and in the same way that I started with the rules, I just wanted to define the terminology. What are guidelines in comparison to rules? Well, guidelines, unlike rules, are not mandatory. They are um, suggested procedures in the practice of law. They're aimed at risk management and loss prevention, and they're there to assist lawyers to, and, and their staff to complete e-reg transactions. From a historical perspective, how did they come about? Well, in 1996, the Joint Committee um, uh, asked Convocation to approve five guidelines for testing purposes. It became clear that uh, when EREG was going to be implemented, that the bar would need assistance with regards to conveyancing practices. Things would have to change. The five guidelines were put forth, and since that date, they've been tested. The Joint Committee uh, received good feedback from the profession, some constructive suggestions, and over the course of that time, changes were made. Uh, we started off with five guidelines. We ended up with six. They were reorganized, and last June, Convocation approved them. I thought that the way I would deal with the guidelines, and I'm going to try not to be repetitive because other speakers are going to be dealing in much more detail with specifics in the guidelines, is just to give you an overview, give you an idea of where you can find things if you're looking for things, and then I'm going to try to address, as I'm going through the guidelines, some of the questions that are typically asked with regards to the issues covered. Um, First guideline, practice guideline one, deals with accounts, maintaining the integrity of access and accounts. And this guideline deals with three things, basically. The first is, it talks about the responsibility of law firms regarding access by users to the e-reg system. It provides that law firms have an obligation to implement procedures to maintain confidentiality of passphrases, to safeguard diskettes, to prevent the sharing of passphrases. The second item it deals with is law firm's responsibilities with regards to accounts. The IRBA account, the electronic registration bank account, user accounts. It talks about the sharing of accounts by lawyers and it reminds lawyers that uh, lawyers who practice in association and not as employed uh, in the manner of employed solicitors cannot share trust accounts and therefore would not be able to share a special trust account. It talks about the fact that if a lawyer becomes suspended, a lawyer may not be able to make compliance with law statements, and as a result, this could impact on his or her ability to register. It reminds lawyers that suspensions could occur for administrative reasons, failure to file, failure to pay fees. The second guideline deals with computerization. The guideline reminds lawyers that they have an obligation to practice competently. And in e-reg, this will mean either um, computerizing the law practice in order to do transactions, or alternatively making arrangements for someone else to do the electronic part of the file. 
The guideline reminds lawyers that they should, if they're not equipped to do e-reg transactions, they should make arrangements early on in the transaction as not to inconvenience other parties. And they must be prepared to compensate whoever does the electronic part of the file for them. Guideline number three, the acknowledgement indirection, another important guideline. In e-reg, documents are signed electronically by the lawyer and or his or her staff. The um, acknowledgement and direction is a form generated by the system. It contains the lawyer's authority from the client to sign and register the document. It protects both the lawyer and the client. The form, as I said, is generated by the system, but the guideline does provide that you could create your own forms. And if you do this, though, the guideline advises that what you should be doing is attaching to it the document registration report generated by the system to ensure that the client approves the actual content that is going to be registered. In addition, the guideline provides that you can use other uh, forms of documents as your acknowledgement and direction. For example, a Polaris form document could be used as your authorization and direction. And we get a lot of questions on this. Very often, institutional lenders will forward a signed Polaris form of uh, discharge of mortgage. I've got three minutes left, so I've got to speed it up. Um, and, and that's perfectly acceptable. Um, practice guideline four, the document registration uh, agreement. Maurizio Romanin is going to be dealing with this in much more detail. Um, and he's the co-chair of the, the Joint Law Society OBA committee. The document registration agreement is a standard form agreement generated, uh, uh, standard form agreement that the joint committee recommends be used when documents, funds and keys are exchanged before registration in electronic registration. A common question, do you have to use a DRA? The uh, guidelines do not require that you use a DRA. It's the recommended form of agreement when you do close uh, by exchanging funds, keys, and documents in advance of closing. Bear in mind, though, that sometimes the agreement of purchase and sale might provide that you have to do it that way, so that would have to be dealt with if you're not going to use the DRA. In some situations, particularly where you have stack transactions or chain transactions, it might make more sense for lawyers to meet in one location and actually do the registration and exchange the documents rather than doing it by DRA, so it's important to keep options open. Uh, where do you find the DRA? It's posted on the Law Society website. The document has gone through several drafts. It's an evolving process, so be careful when you're using these that you have the latest form of DRA. And in terms of the signing of DRAs, um, the guideline provides that you can use it, either lawyers can sign it or it, um, uh, you can, lawyers can exchange letters uh, and agree to be bound by the terms of DRA, of the DRA without actually physically signing the DRA. Uh, and Maurizio, I think, will be speaking more about this. Practice Guideline 5 deals with mortgage transactions. It talks about procedures for discharging mortgages. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because Kathleen Waters is going to be dealing with this topic in, um, in detail and she's going to, to talk about the procedures, that the recommended procedures that you should be following. Practice Guideline 6 deals with use of compliance with law statements. Um, the system basically allows lawyers to make compliance with law statements in the place of filing supporting documents, basically legal opinions. Only lawyers can make these statements. The task cannot be delegated. Lawyers should retain in their uh, files supporting evidence upon which the statements uh, are based in order to protect themselves. Um, the guideline provides that lawyers need not look behind compliance with law statements, but can rely on the provisions of the Land Titles Act as to the sufficiency of title once certified. Other speakers will be speaking on the DR, uh, on the uh, compliance with law statement, so I think I'm going to end it there. Just want to make now some brief and general comments, and this comes largely from my experience in taking the calls. I think there are ways that um, the bar and uh, law clerks and others involved in e-reg transactions can make things easier for themselves. And three points I wanted to make. The first is cooperation. E-REG is premised on the fact that there will be cooperation among the parties. 
Um, unlike the paper system, from the very beginning when you get a file, it's important that uh, there be communication with the other side because de decisions have to be made as to how the transaction is going to proceed. Who starts the preparation of the documents? How will the transaction be closed? Will there be a DRA? Is the transaction part of a stack? Once the transaction is closed, there are obligations to the, advise the other side of, D, of uh, registration if you've used a DRA. As law clerks, you have an important role here. You will probably be making the first contact with the other side. You set the tone for the transaction. You set the tone for your office. You represent your office. Um, if there is no cooperation when e-reg uh, transactions are being closed, I think it's going to be really, really hard for transactions to, to get closed and get closed smoothly. The second is maintaining professionalism. E-reg for the bar means new law, new technology, new conveyancing practices. This could be stressful. There's a learning curve. There's pressure on staff. Um, a lot of work that used to be done at the registry office by conveyancers has now been moved to the law office. Uh, it doesn't take very much when things go wrong in a transaction or a problem arises for tempers to flare and things to get out of hand. If this happens to you, um, try, the only advice I, I could offer is try to step back, cool down, think of the objective to close the real estate deal, try to find solutions, work with the other side. And last but not least, I um, wanted to emphasize the importance of user groups. As eReg is being rolled out, user groups are being formed throughout the province, groups of lawyers and uh, law clerks coming together to support each other and to identify issues of importance and to bring them forth to the joint committee. Um, if we don't know about problems, um, they can't be resolved. So far, we've had a lot of success. Um, the user groups are a good thing, and um, I think the Joint Committee encourages areas uh, where eReg is being rolled out to form them. Just to conclude, one final comment. Um, although eReg is a real challenge, in some ways it's also a real opportunity. It's an opportunity for lawyers and their staff throughout the province to come together, to work together, to shape conveyancing practices and to standardize practices. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of uh, reviewing these materials over and over again. I've been involved in eReg for four to five years now, and I've uh, made the mistake of thinking, well, I, I dealt with that four years ago, and, and uh, the forms have changed. Uh, there are changes to the guidelines, uh, new rules, uh, so please do review that. Uh, next, we're pleased to have Nick Sarkovsky. Uh, Nick has been with Terranet for seven years and is currently the professional services representative for the core Toronto region. Uh, Nick has also been involved with the Toronto user group for the past uh, two years. Thank you, Rosemary, and good morning, everyone. I'll put your slide. My presentation today is on the Terraview Gateway, and it will consist of five components. Uh, the topic areas include searching and mapping in Terraview, the top 10 customer service questions on electronic registration, typical problem areas in electronic registration, the Terraview website, and future Terraview Gateway features. Now the, can you hear me okay? The majority of the presentation um, is with screen captures. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to use a red box to highlight or point out the, the topic area that I'll be focusing on in that particular slide. So look out for that red box. Um, there's a handout that's either being produced or has been produced. I believe Kathy will be handing it out if she hasn't already handed it out. So uh, look out for that. And um, we can begin. So the first area is searching and mapping in Terraview. And the question that arises is how do I find a pin using the map feature. Now the map feature is the seventh or last feature in the property search menu bar. I'm sure uh, for those users that have used Terraview, you've probably seen it, but a lot of you 
haven't necessarily used it. So I thought that uh, part of the presentation uh, will focus on how to find a, a difficult pin if uh, some of the other search tools don't necessarily work out. So you can select the search by map option in the properties drop down menu. Um, beyond that you can either select the specific area or the entire LRO to download that particular map. And you can use the zoom in or zoom out functions or use uh, the find road option. And the next few screens will detail that. So I've actually entered the TerraView software and I've um, selected my registry office or confirmed my registry office and I've opened my docket and I'm attempting to locate a pin. So I've gone into the property drop down and I've selected the search by map option. Beyond that, I have the option of either uh, selecting the entire LRO or specific area. And if I was to select a specific area, uh, the little drop down uh, below uh, select specific area would light up. And if, for instance, we were in New York region, you would find um, areas such as Richmond Hill, uh, Markham, and you could focus in on that particular area. For the example, I'm using entire LRO. I've selected it, I've downloaded the map, and the LRO map for Toronto will appear. So I start out with uh, a rough map of, of Toronto and uh, boundaries nor York in the north, uh, Durham in the east, and Peel in the west. So there are two ways to locate a pin using search by map. I've uh, boxed in the zoom in and zoom out buttons and it's a magnifying glass with a plus sign or a minus sign. And if I'm familiar with, with the Toronto area, and in this example I'm using the northeast corner of, of Toronto, I can select my zoom in function or my zoom in button and continuously zoom in till I get close or close or to my area. So I've zoomed in and um, I get to the corners of Passmore and Markham Road and I probably would have zoomed in about three or four times to display the map that you see before you. Okay. So if you're familiar with a particular area, um, you can rely on these tools and it will get you to your, your uh, pin area. Alternately, if um, I know of a road, if I know the road name, for instance, I can go into the map menu bar, select tools, and select the find road option. And when I do, a little find road screen appears, and I can actually enter the name of the road. And the example that I've used is Turbina Avenue. So I believe that my pin is located on that particular street. So if I select and type in Turbina Avenue, rather than using the zoom in and the zoom out functions, it will basically bring me to the same place, a lot quicker too. So now I'm at the northeast corner of Dynamic and Turbine, and I believe that that's where my pin is located. The next step would be to select the Map Area button, and I've also highlighted that or boxed that in with a red box. When I select that, a little crosshair appears, and using my mouse, I, I focus in on that lock corner and I zoom into that area. So I'm zooming into the northeast corner. I believe my property to be located in the northeast corner. At this point, you should probably be very careful. If, if you know of the intersection, um, rather than trying to get all lot corners, northeast, north, south, so on and so forth, you should focus on the, uh, the lot corner that you believe your property will be located in. So when you select map area and hit OK, you get a large picture of what uh, area you're going to download parcels for. So. Next order of business is to hit the little R button, and that's the retrieval of parcels within your map area. And when I do that, I will get the pins within that box. Okay. Right now I have um, in the dark green or the army green on the, on the east hand side, that would be Markham Road. Um, and then you have Turbina running between, or sorry, you have Dynamic running between Turbina and Markham Road. Now I have I don't know if the mouse is going to work here. No, it's not. I have four pins north of Dynamic and in between my two roads. Okay, I know that two of these properties are fronting on Dynamic. So it obviously helps to have as much information on the property that you're looking for. If I knew, for instance, that my property was a budding or um, was a budding Dynamic, then I would know they would have to be one of these two particular properties. Now, if you have additional information, for instance, if you know of the, the particular lot size, if you know the frontage, if you have some of those details handy, you can actually uh, rely on the uh, map preferences to help you measure the approximate size of 
that particular pin. So what I've done is I've gone into the map dropdown, I've selected map preferences, and a little toolbar uh, appears towards the bottom of the screen. I've also highlighted that or boxed that in in red. And what I can do is I can take my cursor and I can go and select each pin and it will tell me the approximate lot size. So for this particular pin, I've highlighted in red, it says that it's about 35,000 square feet. And that's approximately three quarters of an acre, or just over three quarters of an acre. The property to the right of that that's not highlighted looks to be about three or four times the size, so we're looking at about three acres. So if you have some additional information, if you know the frontage, if you know the lot size, that can uh, make it that much easier to pick out the pin that you're looking for. So I know that uh, my property is just under an acre, and since there are only two properties on Dynamic off of Turbina, I figure that the one in red will probably be my pin. I select it, it turns into a yellow color, and I move to the A button, which will activate that parcel. And when I select it, I get to my search results window. And I believe for those of you that use TerraView, this window looks somewhat familiar, because normally you would enter a municipal address, a name, a reference plan, plan a subdivision, and eventually get to the search results window, which will confirm the PIN number, tell you whether or not the property is active, give you the legal description, and in most instances, give you the municipal address. So I've located my PIN. It's PIN 115. It is in land titles. It is an active property. If I hit the parcel register button, I can then decide whether or not I want to include all active instruments, deleted instruments, click OK and I get my parcel register. Beyond that, if you're searching adjacent pins, I'm going to actually use a different pin as the example. I would um, type in the pin or any other information I have on my subject search, conduct a search, get my parcel abstract, print it out, retrieve all my documents, close out of that abstract, and when we close out of that abstract, we get back to our search results window. And if you notice on the left-hand side of the screen, what we call the tree view, there's an adjacent file folder. As long as you conduct a subject search, if you double-click the adjacent folder, the map will come up again, and it will detail your particular pin and all the abutting pins. So the pin that I quickly searched is in green and then the map comes up and it shows you all the abutting properties and there are, I believe, six abutting properties. You then proceed to use the map and adjacent tabs. You sort of navigate between the two and then you can select which pins you like the search for in order to check your adjacent owners. And always remember, if you are doing an adjacent parcel search, remember to include deleted instruments so that you can, in fact, see if there are any previous owners and compare those names. The second component in the presentation, the top 10 customer service questions on electronic registration. I can't find the document I created yesterday. <laughs> I think I've probably used this once before, but it happened to get this question quite often. And it's, it's a simple answer. Um, just make sure that you've opened the correct docket and you're in the right registry office. Something as simple as that can cause you pain and anguish and loss of time. So always double check, and I'm guilty of it too sometimes, I don't always double check, but that uh, can save you a lot of time. How do I add an additional pin to my document? So I have a transfer document, and the, the very first branch in the transfer document is the properties branch, which allows you to enter the consideration and the pin number. Well, as soon as you enter your first block and pin number, um, a little blue plus icon, and it's actually grayed out, but that's because I've selected it. So right under the message drop-down, I'm not sure if you can see that, there's a little plus sign. That would be highlighted in blue. If I select the plus sign, a new field appears so that I can enter my uh, new block and PIN number. And as soon as I complete that second block and PIN number, and then the blue plus sign would activate itself again, and I can continue to add PINs. So if it was a condo, for instance, and you had the unit, the parking and the locker, uh, that might be an example of when you would add pins. What statements should I select? Well, I'd like you to read through the available statements to see what applies to your situation and, of course, refer to your electronic registration procedures guide 
um, and that's located in your TerraView folder on your desktop, or you probably have a hard copy of it as well. And you can always visit www.terraview.ca. And of course, this will be on the handout um, that should come out shortly. You can also contact the TerraView support line, and uh, Randy's mentioned this number already, the 1-800 number, and speak to either the Ministry of Consumer and Business Services representative or Ministry of Finance representative for land transfer tax questions. Common question, how do I download and import a mortgage schedule from your website? I'm using a mortgage document and I'm in the charge provisions branch. I would then proceed to the web services menu bar, select it, and I can select the view option for mortgage charge schedules. So this is one particular way. There are actually a few ways to get this information. But if we were to use the web services menu bar, this would directly take you to the TerraView .ca website, and for those of you that have never downloaded, uh, there are download instructions, and I've uh, boxed that in in red. If uh, you've done it a few times and you want to get right to the institutions that have their schedules on board, you can simply select downloadable files, and that will take you directly to um, the institutions that have, have documents available or links to their own particular websites. If you were to go into administration and select newsletters, I hope. You guys are all reading your newsletters. Uh, there is a newsletter there, um, 2000, back in July of 2000, and there's um, a bit on importing schedules and text format. How do I edit, remove a schedule that I've imported? Well, if you're not happy with, or if you've incorrectly imported a, a schedule, of course you have to be back into your charge provisions branch. And if you've actually attached something the additional provisions section towards the bottom of the screen, that grays out. What then happens is your schedules branch on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, a little plus sign appears, that's where your schedule attaches. So you actually have to go back to your charge provisions branch, bring your cursor down to the gray area and right-click. When you right-click, the remove option appears. You can remove and then go back and start all over. How do I give another lawyer or clerk access to a document that I've created? Two ways. If um, you're going to send out a document, uh, you want to go into the message drop down, compose your message, and there are actually two, two fields that you can use to help you locate the individual that, that you're messaging to. You can search by account, so you can type in the law firm, or you can search by individual. If you search by law firm, um, then you will get a list of individuals in the to field, and you can obviously select that particular name, write your message, and then hit send, and that will send the document to the other party. If it's internal, um, you should probably do this as soon as you get on board, and that would be to go into your uh, administration drop-down, select user authority. When you do that, and it's, it's really beneficial for medium to large size firms, if there are multiple users, you'll probably want to do this once and go in and review each name and, and select or put in a check mark beside the name, the individual that you want to share your documents with. You want to do this uh, once and it's, it's day forward. If you want to remove that function, you can do the same. Just go in and remove the check mark. How do I accept access to a document? So someone has messaged you a document. Um, when you first log into TerraView under the uh, available balance, um, we will display whether or not there's a new message waiting for you as long, as well as if there's a new newsletter waiting for you. But if you have a new message waiting for you, you should see that as soon as you log in. And when you do, if you go into your message drop down, you select view new messages you see an inbox, and my boss has sent me a message, and maybe your boss will send you a message. No, if the other lawyer has sent you a message, uh, you will see the name, or if the law clerk has sent you a message, you will see that individual's name. You would right-click that person's name, and the accept access feature would light up. As soon as you select accept access, the docket list will appear and allow you to associate that document to a particular docket, if it hasn't already been opened, and you can create it right there and then. How do I print reports? Uh, there are two reports that you'd probably be printing from time to time, the acknowledgement and direction and the document preparation report. And both of those reports will be in the instrument menu bar. It's the second option from the bottom. It's reports. If you select reports, 
In the select report drop down, you can select acknowledgement and direction or document preparation. If you select the acknowledgement and direction, then you can pick the, the party names and hit the print button. Um, the document preparation is also in the select report field and that will basically give you a hard copy of what you've completed up to the point of the request. So for quick answers to most TerraView software questions, I mentioned this before, read all of your TerraView newsletters, um, keep your quick reference guide at your PC, refer to the reference manuals, and of course you can contact customer service or view the customer service link on our website, which I'll cover in, in further detail. Third segment is typical problem errors in electronic registration. Just a few slides on this. This happens from time to time. Someone may open up a document and realize that uh, they are not able to make any changes. And that's usually because the other firm has a document open at the same time. If you come across that, um, try giving that firm a call just to see whether or not they're also in the document. Because if, if you're the second of the two parties to open up the document, there isn't very much you can do unless the, the first firm closes it. Uh, another problem, uh, sometimes, if user authority was never granted, the, uh, the other user in the law firm can access that document. So make sure that you grant that prior to sharing your documents. Um, messages sent to recipients that no longer work for a firm. It's very important that if, if a member uh, leaves a firm that their PSP or their personal security package is cancelled. Because if it's not, their name still exists in the database. And if that's the person that you're used to dealing with, if you continue to message them, um, the firm will, will not know that there's a message waiting for them. So it's important that uh, if someone leaves or switches to another position, that their diskette is canceled. And of course, if you send a message to someone that's not preparing the document, you'll probably wonder what the heck it's doing in their inbox. Um, so you know, if, if you don't have the name of that individual, it probably still helps to, to make the phone call and, and find out who on that other, who in that firm is, is working on the document. Just little helpful tips, but it can help you and, and save you some time. Law statements not signed by lawyer. If, if a law clerk is, is selecting compliance of law statements, um, some of them are not necessarily aware that they cannot sign the document, um, so be aware. Documents not organized in a proper docket. I mentioned that in the first customer service question. Um, if, if you prepare a transfer in one docket and you forgot that you've opened a docket for it and you open up another docket for the mortgage and you work on those two documents in different dockets and you wonder why you can't register, register them in order, it's probably because they haven't been put in the proper docket. And person signing for completeness does not have electronic registration bank account access. When you set up your, your paperwork with uh, Terranet, uh, there's a section in the personal security package application form where the ad administrator can select herb access or deselect herb access. So I know that uh, in the past there have been some people that um, filled out their application forms and didn't bother to select herb access. So you might want to double check with uh, customer service to see that you have herb access. The fourth component is the Terraview website. And we've just recently changed this. If you were to type in www.terview.ca, this is the home page that would appear. And towards the top of the screen, there's a caricature of a customer service rep with a headphone or telephone. If you were to select that customer service icon, this is the home page for customer service. And it's, it's pretty much subdivided into two parts. Left hand side, we have the help center, and on the right hand side, we have the tech center. And we have subgroups within uh, the help center and the tech center. So uh, commonly with, with the help center, where do I find? How much does it cost? Um, we've tried to group a lot of those questions in, into those headings. And maybe for your IT person, um, you know, technical information, ports, uh, system requirements, hardware requirements. Uh, we've tried to group those into the, the two different sections so that you can navigate through the website. And I've gone into the Help Center, and I've selected the Frequently Asked Questions. And we've actually subdivided the Frequently Asked Questions into subgroups as well. Um, so if it was administrative, administrative nature, or electronic newsletter nature, um, then you can select that part, and it'll guide you to uh, those questions in, in the website. A lot of you um, that have used the system probably earlier on 
uh, more so earlier on than now, probably received some sort of error message in the past, and it's usually in the form of a number. Um, the one example that I'm using is a 19027, which I know is, is usually an intranet connection problem. And in the past, you've probably called customer service to figure out why the heck uh, you may have received that uh, error message. Well, now within the, within the website, you can go to the system message section, and if you do receive a numbered error, you can type it in, and if you type it in, you get a response to what that uh, error is and how to resolve it. It's really quick. And the last component is the future Terraview Gateway features. And Randy touched on some of these. I'm going to actually show you some screen captures of some of these changes. Um, within your document identification branch, we've added in transfer client file number and transferee client file number. So you can put in your, your docket number when you send out uh, to the recipient. Uh, the deponents tab, you would select either party to or party from. The ability to view plans. Um, in the past, you probably probably used to seeing a zero beside the reference plan or the plan of subdivision. Um, you will now be able to, or in the near future, be able to select and, and, and view plans. Now, a lot of this is going to really depend on the hardware that you have. Um, obviously, if you have a small screen and you attempt to view a plan of subdivision, it's going to be a little, little difficult. You're probably going to have to pan, you know, different directions. If if you don't necessarily have a plotter. Um, might be hard to print some things, but if you have regular reference plans and you want to download them, uh, this is technically or typically what they're going to look like. And of course, if you have good hardware, you probably get a good print out of this and get it on one sheet. Future gateway features, future Terraview gateway features in the land transfer tax affidavit. Um, if all selected on the screen, the deponents tab names appear in the statements on screen. And with a do docket tax fee summary available to all users in the account. So the username that's signed for completeness and registration number uh, will be displayed on the report. So anyone can access that. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. That's uh, very helpful. You guys are hesitating on clapping. You can clap. It's all right. We can <laughs> liven it up. Yay. For the, for the rest of our speakers. Anyways, um, our next speaker, Mark Durward, will be speaking to us from Hamilton. He's a sole practitioner in Hamilton and an active member of the Hamilton Law Association Real Estate Committee and co-chair of that association's electronic registration subcommittee. He's also a member of the OBA Electronic Searching Subcommittee and a member of the Joint Committee on Electronic Registration. How does he have time to practice? Anyways, over to Mark. Uh, for instance, uh, there are uh, certain, um, there's a lot, a lot of noise coming through there. Can everyone hear me okay? Is there a difficulty hearing me? Yes. Oh, there is, eh? Okay. 
Well, then I'm going to have to change locations, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'll move over there. Can you hear me a little better now? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so the uh, first uh, reason you may want to go, you uh, might uh, have to go to the registry office is when you can't do something on the system that you want to be able to do on the system. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, if you want to register uh, an easement, uh, uh, granted by a condominium corporation, you can't do that on the system because the system will not show the condominium corporation as an owner. Um, also, if you're registering a document that will affect um, how's that? <laughs> if you're re registering a, a document uh, that uh, exceeds uh, the current uh, folder capabilities uh, of the uh, registration system, uh, you'll need to do it by paper. Uh, those are documents uh, that if you want to register more than 125 documents at one time in a folder, you won't be able to in that folder. If you want to register a document that affects more than 375 properties, you won't be able to do that either electronically. If you have more than 250 parties to or more than 250 parties from, uh, you won't be able to register those documents electronically uh, either. Uh, so you'll either have to break your folder up into more than one folder or you'll have to just register the document um, uh, in paper. For instance, something like an airport zoning regulation that affects uh, hundreds and hundreds of properties, you're going to have to register that in paper for the time being. Uh, the other thing, of course, uh, the most obvious thing that came to my mind when I was preparing for the paper is anything to do with the registry system. If your document is uh, wholly or partly registered within the registry system, you're going to have to do the searching and the registering at the registry office. I say wholly or partly because, remember, there are still some of those uh, odd properties that are registered in both systems. Uh, the other reason uh, you may uh, need to go to the registry office uh, is uh, to uh, access documents that are not currently available on the system. Uh, I, in my paper, I uh, talk about the notorious situation where your thumbnail description indicates that title to the property may be subject to certain interests. That might be anything from um, uh, the uh, situation uh, where uh, someone in 1960 purchased the property using uh, their first name, middle name, and last name. They conveyed the property in 1964 forgetting to use their middle name, uh, the uh, thumbnail description will uh, indicate that uh, the property may be subject to the interest of the person using their middle name. Um, that can uh, create a lot of extra work, as we all know, trying to track that down. Um, and uh, what will happen sometimes as well is the document referenced in the thumbnail description may no longer be available electronically because of the subsequent transfer of the property. As you all know, when the property is subsequently transferred after it's been converted, the original transfer will uh, be deleted from the uh, uh, parcel register. So you may have to go to the register office to obtain a copy. Uh, also, you may need to go to the registry office to deal with um, what I uh, reference as uh, rogue registrations uh, or uh, historical blanket registrations. What I mean by that is a situation where, a, um, uh, as an example, one I came across recently, uh, there was a plan of subdivision registered uh, the 18, early, late 1800s, early 1900s. A uh, very large lot was created. Um, uh, there was an easement uh, provided along the northern boundary of the lot. Uh, subsequently, there was a resubdivision. I was dealing with the parcel at the extreme southern tip, about 150 feet or more away from where the uh, four or five foot easement uh, um, was registered, um, uh, where the easement was. Um, 
my parcel had on the abstract the reference to the easement. Now, the easement really didn't affect my property at all. The easiest way for me to correct that was a personal visit to the registry office, and the registrar was able to use the authority granted to make an order to immediately rectify the problem. So in dealing with that kind of thing, sometimes a personal visit is the easiest and quickest way to go. It's very difficult to handle that kind of situation by telephone. Also, you may want to search behind the documents that are listed in the parcel register if you're concerned about corporatist cheats, which are not dealt with in the conversion process, and if you're concerned and to follow up on Planning Act issues subsequent to the conversion. There are certain times when we need to go to the land registry office because we have to. One example of that is when we need to deliver a land transfer tax rebate application after the closing. Now let me just stop for a second and say when I talk about going to the land registry office, what I mean is not being able to do what you want to do on the system. We either go to the land registry office in person, we attend through an agent, for instance, it's always nice to have a law clerk to send to the registry office to do that, or we might access the registry office through mail. Some offices that are not located as close to the land registry office as mine, for instance, may mail the land transfer tax rebate application in as opposed to going to the office. Some people will attend the land registry office by choice to close their real estate transactions. For instance, as I said earlier, all registry properties have to be closed there. Some people may make arrangements to attend to close even electronic registration deals at the registry office if they are involved in stacked transactions where it's just more convenient to attend in one spot to attend to exchange of funds as we did in the old days in the paper system. I don't personally use that technique as much, it's just as easy for me to circulate the money directly to the other office, but I know of some offices that still do that. There are some offices still who don't want to take advantage of the ability to make compliance with law statements in some documents, and so they choose to index the evidence required to support the document at the land registry office. I've come across a situation in some power of sale situations where they've chosen to index the information and in some estate transactions. The other opportunity that people might want to attend is usually seen during the transition period to a full electronic registration, where as Randy Reese indicated earlier, they will choose to register paper documents that have been signed prior to the enactment of the second or compulsory regulation in that particular jurisdiction. There are certain other documents that in the general electronic registration regulation, that's a regulation 19-99, that are listed as documents, they're exempted from the definition of documents and therefore are essentially exempt from electronic registration. They include land titles, plans, declarations, and descriptions under the Condominium Act, and other sort of obscure condominium documentation. In my paper in paragraph 3, I refer to OREG 5201. That regulation actually amended regulation 19-99, and if you just look at the current version of that regulation 19-99, all the documents are listed there. And I think that's about covered most of the situations that I've come across. 
and that uh, I've been able to dig up uh, through some research. And I will uh, note that in Randy's paper at page uh, 14, there's a list of uh, other documents uh, that uh, are either uh, optional uh, registrations uh, in the paper system or are required to be registered in the paper system. Uh, thank you very much. Over to you, Toronto. Oh, and just one housekeeping issue. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mark, very much and for, for helping us uh, um, w go through those initial glitches. It went off very well after that. Um, Hamilton was the second office uh, to go mandatory two and a half years ago. Uh, so although our focus is on e-reg today, it's clear that paper registrations and registry office attendances uh, will continue for some years to come. So uh, your material is very helpful, Mark. Um, Kathy Christie was uh, called to uh, the Ontario Bar in 1980 and practices commercial real estate at Tories. Uh, she's responsible for electronic uh, registration issues at the firm. Kathy will now deal uh, with registry properties where the majority of the jurisdiction has converted to LTQ. So uh, these are what are known as the non-converts problems. Thanks, Rosemary. Good morning. Um, my paper is going to be dealing with uh, registry problem registry properties under two heads. The first, recognize, recognizing a problem registry when you see it, and then secondly, how you deal with them. I'm also going to touch upon fairly briefly on uh, what you do when your abutting lands are in land titles. Um, the assumption here is that the registry office you're dealing with is a converted registry office. Uh, so you can, you know you've got a problem registry property when your land is still under the registry system. Um, under a converted office, your lands are either going to be land titles absolute or land titles uh, qualified or registry non-convert. So that's your first tip off that you've got a property, that uh, a problem that they haven't been able to convert because of a problem in the, uh, in the property. Um, you may be, <coughs> excuse me, you may uh, find that your the reasons for non-conversion are a myriad of reasons. They could be um, breaks in the chain of title, uh, clouds on title, legal description problems, and depending on the nature of your problem, the way you resolve them is, uh, is dependent on, on the problem itself. Um, there are two types of registry parcels you may encounter. The first is uh, the parcelized day forward, which isn't being created anymore, but originally when, when automation was first um, uh, being implemented in the province, registry properties or properties that were going to be converted were um, put into parcelized day forward, which meant that they just went back to the last, the most recent transfer and created your, your, your pin from that and then uh, abstracted the, the subsequent registrations. Um, Clearly, if you're confronted with a, with a PDF, they're not creating them anymore, but you still may encounter them, you have to go back to the registry office and do your full 40-year search. Your other registry non-convert pins may be now a full 40-year load. Um, you should still go back to the registry office to do your title search because one of, the, one of the components now of your title search is also to review the file at the registry office, which will be kept by the staff, that gives you the reasons why the, problem, the, the property wasn't converted. Um, so make sure you go to the office or your conveyancer goes to the office, reviews the file, and uh, brings that information back to you as to what the problem was so you can try to then, you know, draft the documentation in order to resolve it. Um, just, you know, one of the things that, that I think is fairly common is a lot of people, when they, they see a, a pin printed off, um, they think that that's their search. If you've got, I mean, it's not a full land title search, and it's even less a full registry search. So make sure that, first of all, you, you check your top and see if it's, a, if it's got an R in it. It's a registry pin, and you've got to go back and do your full title search, and don't rely on just the pin as, as your search. So you do have to... Going on, on Mark Durward's, uh, uh, just expanding upon, upon his theme, um, you do have to go back to the registry office and do your full 40-year search the old-fashioned way. You're not going to be doing an electronic search in registry. <clears throat> now, for registry non-converts, I mean, 
in reality, the problems, the, the, the conversion process ends up falling on the, on the end user. We're the ones that are going to have to correct whatever the issues were, what the problems were in order to create, uh, in order to convert the, the property into a land titles qualified, or if the, the problems uh, are, are not something that can be um, resolved by just doing a, a, um, a declarations or, or providing whatever evidence was missing um, in order to enable, to enable the staff to convert the property, you may have to do a first application under land titles. <coughs> Excuse me. So once you've, once you've reviewed your title and once you've reviewed your file, what you will end up having to do is figure out basically how would you have resolved the problems if you were if you were going to be requisitioning these title issues in a requisition letter. Uh, what were the, what were the documents you would have required or the evidence you would have required in order to to fix the problems? And that's basically going to be your starting point in fixing the problem in your application to convert from registry non-convert to land titles qualified. And Alan Silverstein has very kindly provided me with a, with a sample of, of documentation that he used, and also I'm using the, the example that, that follows his, um, uh, the, the example that, that his documentation was, was to address. His, um, his situation was he had a corporate name change that wasn't brought forward in the, um, in the chain of title. The document, the, the name change document had been registered in the general register, but when that corporation transferred, did its first transfer with a new name, didn't recite the, the registration particulars. So you've got a break in, in the chain of title. The first, um, the first step was to do a solicitor's affidavit um, deposited on title under the Registry Act under Section 106. Uh, attesting to the fact that the that the that the the, the name change, the corporate name change, was contained in instrument number whatever in the GRs, that was then deposited on title. So that brings forward on your on the title that the the first step in in identifying where the name change was located. There was a registration fee for that first deposit. The second step was. Um, Doing, doing a declaration that says you've done a full title search, you've done a planning act search, um, this is setting out the legal description of the lands and also setting out the encumbrances. So this then goes in another declaration, which is then also deposited on title, and this is what affects your actual conversion. I mean, in effect, it's like doing a first app. It's the same sort of um, evidence, the same sort of documentation, the, the, the same statements, solicitor's statements that you would have made in your first app to have the uh, uh, property um, transferred into land titles absolute. And now there was, uh, there was no registration fee for the second deposit. Both deposits were under the Registry Act. Allen also had both documents, both declarations pre-approved. So even though it's not a, a land titles uh, you know, documentation, they were pre-approved so that, that everything could go ahead in a fairly regular way. Um, now the problem with, with that was that it still took time, even though everything was pre-approved and this was, you know, in, in all effect, a fairly straightforward type of, of resolution. It still took about a month before the property was converted in from registry non-convert to, to land titles. Um, I have included in my, my materials a copy of um, uh, the declaration that Alan did use for this, the second declaration, so that you can see what the statements are that are required um, for that particular situation anyway to, um, to effect the, the, non -con the, the conversion. And I've also included um, in my materials a ministry prepared by the, the uh, a memo prepared by the ministry, which outlines the the process of uh, converting from registry non-convert to, to land titles. <clears throat> and very briefly, just touching upon uh, when your proper when your properties abutting properties are in land titles. First of all, when do you do an abutting land search? It's the same old, same old reasons. Planning Act compliance, confirmation of boundaries, easements, confirmation of easements and rights of way, and, and access. Um, those searches, when your abutting lands are in land titles, those searches will be done electronically. Um, 
the problem that I think you run into with, with, um, with relying solely on the electronic environment for your um, abutting land search is boundary confirmation. We've had situations in the office where um, e even though you know, we, we, we got the pin maps, the abutting pin maps, uh, we found that we couldn't rely on them because, because of legal description problems in them. You know, the, the pin maps are there for, uh, more for convenience. They, they show you what, what abuts you, but you still have to go and do your plotting to make sure that, that your boundaries um, don't overlap, don't have gaps, don't have inconsistencies with your own, own legal description problems. Uh, we've also found that, that the, um, the pin maps from TerraView aren't usually as up to date as the ones from the registry office, so you should probably go to the registry. Another reason to go to the registry office is to get your pin maps from the registry office. Um, so, in summary, just the main points to take away from this is um, first of all, make sure you know what you're dealing with. Are you dealing with a registry pin or a land titles pin? So, you know, start with that, and, and if you've got a registry pin, um, you got to go to the registry office, search your title, search the file. Um, work with the registry office staff to determine what documentation you need in order to correct your, uh, your problem and have the property converted into land titles. Um, and then last, my last point is uh, in your abutting land search, um, make sure you're dealing with the properties that you know you, you're dealing with, that you don't have, um, uh, you haven't just relied on your pins to, to determine the abutting lands, do your full um, plotting of boundaries. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. I think those are very important lessons we should take away from it. The maps look very pretty, but we got to make sure at the end of the day that they are correct and reflect reality. Our next speaker is Kathleen Waters. Kathleen is currently Vice President Title Plus with the Lawyers Professional Indemnity Company. She has extensive experience in real estate law and related administrative law and the repair and or defense of negligence claims against lawyers. She serves on the executive of the Real Property Section of the OBA and the Joint Committee for Electronic Registration. And she'll talk to us today about discharges of mortgages, what's new, what's different. Thank you, Silvana. Uh, I'm going to focus really on three significant changes this morning, although there's some more material in the paper. The first is how institutional lenders are registering their own discharges and what issues that might create. Secondly, how private mortgages can be discharged under e-reg. And thirdly, how you're going to deal with your payout of mortgage proceeds when you're acting for the, uh, for the purchaser. So first off, institutional lenders. Well, certainly the, uh, the word that I am hearing is that there is a significant proportion of the institutional lenders uh, registering their own discharges, <coughs> probably about half of them based on some informal surveying I've done. And I, I, I gather based on feedback from registry office staff and from uh, Terranet staff that in fact when, an when a, a jurisdiction first goes optional e-reg, the initial big load of registrations will often be mortgage discharges because the institutional lenders are just ready to roll and start discharging there. So the first thing to know about uh, these institutional uh, discharges is that it will have an impact on the wording of the, uh, the lawyer's uh, undertaking to discharge that mortgage. So the undertaking that the vendor's lawyer gives Historically, you would have probably seen wording like the vendor's lawyer is undertaking to obtain and register a discharge. Well, of course, under e-reg, if the lender's going to register the discharge themselves, the lawyer's probably want, going to want wording more like to cause a discharge of the mortgage to be registered. Secondly, uh, some law firms are saying that uh, they're a bit nervous of these lenders saying that they're going to discharge these mortgages and then we've had some incidents of uh, letters coming from the lender after the fact saying, you know what, go ahead lawyer and register on my behalf. You know, we've changed our minds. So some firms are holding back $70 just in case they do get stuck doing that registration. 
but you know, that's up to you. And finally, if you are in these situations where you're being instructed to do the registration on behalf of the institution, you should watch out and really consider who from the institution is instructing you to do this. Uh, in the paper world, you know, the discharge just came in the mail, right? And you assumed that the people who had signed it were the right people, et cetera, and you just took it to the registry office and registered it. Now, you know, you may have to watch out that you get a letter that's signed by employee A saying that employee X and Y have authorized you to register the discharge as the actual vice presidents or what have you. Well, you may want a bit closer chain of authority from those actual people than that. Or in some cases, I've heard that it's actually just like a memo that isn't signed by anybody that comes that says register the discharge. So some law firms are following up on those sorts of instructions a bit more and getting a, a firmer chain of authority to register. Let's go on to uh, private lenders. Well, the uh, historic rule is still the same. You're not going to be giving or accepting undertakings to discharge private mortgages absent very extraordinary circumstances like your client has bound themselves to do that in the agreement of purchase and sale or what have you. So your discharge in this case is going to have to be included in the folder of documents that you're electronically registering on closing unless you're lucky enough that the vendors actually manage to pay it out and you know get it discharged ahead of closing. That's fine. As long as the discharge document is part of your folder so you're probably going to have, you know, the discharge, the transfer, the, the new mortgage going on. There's no undertaking being given around that, if you see what I mean. It's actually being registered on closing. So that's okay for a private mortgage discharge. And that will happen one of uh, two ways. Either the vendor's lawyer will probably have been in touch with the private lender and been instructed by the private lender that it's okay to do it that way. And in effect there, the vendor's kind of lawyers also acting for the private lender, let's say, for this purpose. Uh, in the alternative, the private lender may have their own lawyer involved in the situation, in which case you would likely do a three-way document registration agreement where you're all agreeing that, you know, these are the things that are going to be registered and this is how the money is going to flow and uh, setting up your process for closing the deal. If it um, happens that maybe your law firm is going to be the one acting for the private lender, one uh, little uh, thing to think about, a little tip. You may want to prepare the discharge and then say, well, okay, I'm not hanging around on the day of closing to actually register the discharge. I'll release it for registration to the vendor's lawyer in trust under the uh, document registration agreement. Well, whoever signs for completeness, remember, gets charged the registration fee. So if you had prepared the discharge on behalf of your private lender client, signed it for completeness, you would want to be sure somewhere in this process you were getting the registration fee on the discharge funds or you know, something like that because you're going to be the firm that gets hit for the uh, registration costs. Now let's move on to the third topic, the uh, transfer of the payout proceeds when you're discharging a mortgage. For many, many years now, I think we've all been used to the idea that the funds to pay out the mortgages have been physically segregated from the rest of the closing funds in separate certified checks. So you know how you get your direction refunds and, you know, there's the money to pay out the first mortgagee, the money to pay out the second mortgagee, you know, maybe something else. And finally, there's the balance to the vendor's law firm and trust, and you take over this whole pile of certified checks to the closing. Well, the reason why, of course, that you segregated those funds for the first, maybe in second mortgagee was because if you actually made the check payable to CIBC or Royal Bank or what have you, there was a lot less likelihood that that money would end up anywhere else, right? And your purchaser client wants to know those mortgages are going to get paid off and disappear off title. So under eReg, you can certainly still send the money that way if you're either, um, if you're somehow doing paper checks for closing. So you could be doing uh, that because you're sending them by courier or you're going to send them by taxi or you're going to physically meet somewhere. You're going to go over to the other lawyer's office to close, for example. 
However, uh, you know, everybody knew that was kind of unfortunate because the whole point of e-reg was for people just to be able to stay in their offices and work from their desk, right? You didn't want to have to run around all over town or use all these couriers. So people have uh, started to adopt some new processes or perhaps use them more commonly. Some people will uh, try to wire money to the vendor's lawyer's bank. So they'll go to their own bank and say, you know, wire money to the bank up in Richmond Hill or what have you. Another possibility, or at least what some people are doing, is they go to a local branch of the vendor's law firm bank. So let's say the vendor's law firm uh, has a branch, is with the Royal Bank. And, but they're at a Royal Bank branch in Newmarket. You say to yourself, well, hold on, there's a Royal Bank branch downstairs in my building. Why don't I just take the money down there and say, credit this to account number such and such at bank such and such. Now, in either of those cases, the money that's going to pay out a mortgage isn't going to be segregated. It's just going to be a lump amount dumped into the vendor lawyer's bank account. From the purchaser's perspective, you know, in theory, this increases the risk that that money that should go to the lender may end up someplace else, right? Because you're depending on the vendor's law firm to be honorable and take the share of the money that's going to pay out the dis the, uh, to get the discharge. However, it's not just risky from the purchaser's perspective. There's also a risk on the vendor's side. Be just because money hits your trust account in some remote way doesn't mean that that's necessarily cleared funds. And if the vendor's lawyer is going to have to retransact that money immediately, if those funds don't eventually clear through the Canadian Payments Association, the uh, vendor law firm is on the hook. They've got to make good to their trust account. Um, so one alternative, although I don't know it's hugely popular, is to have the purchaser's lawyer give the undertaking that they are going to send the payout funds to pay off the vendor's mortgagee. Uh, and you do sort of a cross undertaking thing. So that way the purchaser knows that the money that's supposed to go to the old first mortgagee is actually going to get to that person. The other alternative uh, that meets the requirements of the Law Society guideline, and this is in guideline number five, is the uh, real-time funds transfer program that LawPro established with the Bank of Montreal. And it gives real value, real-time, instantaneous account-to-account -account transfer of funds. And in that case, under the guideline, you are allowed to combine effectively the two types of funds, the mortgage payout monies and the monies for, that are just, you know, eventually going to end up for the vendor to use. Now, the, the details on that system, the uh, real-time funds transfer system, are at Appendix D. The, the one trick to this, though, is both of the law firms need to have trust accounts with the Bank of Montreal. Now, you can certainly have, however, multiple mixed trust accounts. So it's not that you have to give up your main banking institution. It's just that you need to set up the facility to be able to do this sort of transfer. And if you, if you think of the way, like you might have internet banking personally, and you can go online and you can move money from, you know, your savings account to your checking account, and you can go right into your checking account and say, oh, yes, there it is. Well, this is a system where if you were the purchasing law firm, you would go online and say, you know, send, you know, $200,000 to account number such and such, phone the other law firm, they would be able to log on at their end and say, oh, yes, here's my money, come in. It, it's that instantaneous and it's guaranteed real value. So there can be no clawback of those funds if anything goes wrong. Um, the, the accounting process, how this works, is dealt with in Bylaw 19 of the Law Society, and that bylaw is at Appendix C. Certainly the Law Pro BMO system meets the requirements of the bylaw, but other institutions could choose to set up a similar system if they wanted. I'm just not aware of any of them having done it yet. Um, and of course, the number one question everyone always has about this is, well, why can't we have a system between different banks? Why do we need to have, you know, both have our accounts at the same bank? 
And that goes absolutely to the heart of the bylaw system of the Canadian Payments Association. And there would need to be major revisions in Ottawa as to how the Canadian Payments Association operates for us to be able to do real-time, real-value transfer account to account between different institutions. Now, for those of you who act on the, the really big commercial deals, sort of the over 25 million uh, area, you may find that you're starting to use, use something called LVTS, the Large Value Transaction System. It is certainly a guaranteed real value, so there's no chance of the funds being clawed back. But um, it isn't guaranteed to be real time. People at the institutions likely have to intervene on each side. And when you hear people from uh, Canadian Payments Association or the banks talk about that system, they're constantly saying, well, you know, call us a few days in advance and call us the morning of closing and all that. And it's hard to get them to understand that particularly in residential real estate, you know, individual clerks could be dealing with a dozen deals in the course of a day. You don't have all these hours and hours and hours to set up in advance how you're going to do the funds transfer for each deal. And so that's one of the advantages of the Law Pro BMO system. You control it all right on your computer, just the way you control eReg. Anyhow, when you get a chance, uh, hopefully you'll uh, find the paper uh, helpful. And uh, thank you very much. Kathleen, as always, uh, this is most helpful. Uh, on most residential and many commercial sales, uh, there are one or more mortgages to be discharged. Uh, so there are many procedural changes to consider, and uh, your practical tips very helpful. Uh, next, we have uh, Maurizio Romanen. And uh, Maurizio has practiced uh, for 16 years in the uh, commercial real estate area. He's been in, in an instructor and lecturer uh, at Bar Ed courses for 10 years. Uh, Maurizio has been involved in e-reg since before the first e-registration uh, and has been very helpful uh, in uh, many aspects of uh, helping us understand uh, and uh, adopt the various e-reg procedures. Maurizio? Thank you, Rosemary. Um, first, I'd like to welcome everyone here, and including the people that are uh, remotely or non-remotely or at the other locations participating with us through the, uh, through, the, through the network that the Law Society has set up. Today, I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to rush. I apologize, but there's a lot of things I want to cover. And the things that I want to cover are, number one, talk a little bit about document registration agreement. Number two, talk a little bit about compliance with law statements. And thirdly, and most importantly, talk about electronic registration, you and your role in the law office. And that's not even in the paper, so I'm going to try to focus on item three, because if you really want to get into items one and two, you can actually read my paper, and that's there. So how's that? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the document registration agreement first. Why? That's the first thing I have on, on my little cheat notes here. Why is there a document registration agreement? The answer to that is quite simple. Electronic registration provides us with a remote capability but that remote capability does not transcend, remote electronic capability does not transcend everything we have to exchange on closing, unfortunately. You heard Kathleen talk about money, and there's other documents that are not registration documents that somehow have to get exchanged. The process of creating the document registration agreement was a long process of consultation. Okay, it's not something that just came out and everyone thought that looks good and we'll ship it out there and people can use it. There was a great deal of consultation involved in creating it with a lot of user groups. And I think the one that's on the Law Society's website now, the most current version, is probably at least the 10th iteration of the document registration agreement. So it's had sort of a lot of trial through the battle of real estate closings, and it's been amended several times. Make sure that you have a latest version. I think it's dated April 15th as the latest version. I'll talk a little bit about that as we move through the document registration agreement. What the document registration agreement does quite simply, is it creates an escrow closing procedure. It allows you to close the deal remotely in escrow. How do we use the document registration agreement? Again, you've heard some people talk. It's evolved, actually, in the Middlesex area into a closing protocol as opposed to actually an agreement that's signed in exchange. And what I mean by that is, and what, what the Joint Committee actually hoped would happen is, at the end of the day, we would be so accustomed to the 
to the practice the document registration, document registration agreement sets out, that we could simply say, we're going to close on the basis of this agreement that's posted here, and here's the, the two or three items of detail that we're going to provide that have to go to fill in that agreement, i.e., uh, who's registering, for instance, you can confirm that the purchaser solicitor is going to be registering. A release deadline, if it's going to be different than the 6 o'clock deadline, that is the default provision in the DRA. And the documents that you want to include as the documents that have to be registered as part of the escrow provisions in the DRA. So if you, if you just mention those three things in a letter and say we're going to ascribe or uh, live up to the closing, this closing protocol, we believe that that's as effective as actually exchanging the document itself, and we hope that as the practice gets more f familiar with that process, that's the movement that occurs. How the agreement works, I'm not going to go through a clause by clause review, it's in the paper, but you can think of it as four basic principles. First of all, it talks about escrow, holding things in trust and only releasing them in accordance with the agreement. That's the first principle. The second principle is registration. Who's going to register the documents, i.e the vendor's solicitor, the purchaser's solicitor, or another solicitor if you're actually using a three-party DRA. The third principle is what I call the principle of notification. People are going to notify each other that they've received documents, notify each other that if there's any problems with the stuff they've received, and notify each other that they've registered. Sort of like a let's be courteous and nice to each other provisions. Fourthly, the unwinding or the undoing if there's a problem. The agreement specifically provides that we've exchanged stuff, but if for any reason whatsoever somebody doesn't want to go through it, go through th the registration, then we can unwind it, re-exchange, and we'll assume our positions from a legal perspective at that point. Whether you have to you know, f finish off with a tender at that point is something that the lawyer should decide. So remember, it's escrow, registration, notification, unwinding are the basic things that are dealt with in the document registration agreement. I talked a little bit about the most recent, recent version. It's April 15th on the Law Society website. The most recent change that necessitated that version is the change dealing with the movement of funds in bulk if, in fact, you're using that real-time fund transfer system that Kathleen Waters talked about. I think that's in paragraph one. The area form of offer includes provisions dealing with that, that sort of authorize the use of the document registration agreement. Alan will talk a little bit about that in more detail as part of his presentation. Quickly, some issues, and there's always have to be issues since we're in the legal profession, regarding the document registration agreement. First and foremost, what do we put in Schedule A? Now, I delivered a paper at the Institute a couple weeks ago now, I think, and in that paper I said there's a very legal legalistic position being taken by some firm saying the only thing that's ever going to go in Schedule A is the transfer. And I say to my people, that's a sort of overly legalistic position to take because quite frankly, without the mortgage being registered, there'd be no funds. Without, no, without any funds, there'd be no closing. So I think it's appropriate that the transfer and the mortgage are included in Schedule A. The second issue is who signs the document. Now, who should confirm that they're ascribing to the protocol? Now, this is a very serious issue in my from my perspective because, quite frankly, the Joint Committee, the Law Society, and lawyers consider the document registration agreement as an undertaking. As an undertaking, it should be signed by a lawyer or confirmed by a lawyer. The, other thing, the third issue is the form of the document registration agreement and the LPIC position in relation to it. LPIC has taken the position that if there's a, a loss, an innocent party suffers a loss as a result of the document registration agreement and the lawyer is sued, the innocent lawyer is sued in negligence because of the use of the document registration agreement, that lawyer will not be subject to their deductible or uh, the surcharge as a result of the claim. Now, that position is on the LPIC website. What is that? That has caused some concern to people because sometimes they want to change the form of the DRA to reflect three-party deals. Well, you're going to have to change it regardless of LPIC's position to accommodate third-party deals. And the issue is really going to be on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, is this an appropriate use of the document registration agreement? And people are using it in a third-party context for, for instance, private lenders dealing with discharges and in deals where a lender's lawyer is actually being involved as part of the closing. A 
sample three-party uh, DRAs included with uh, Kathleen's materials. Moving on to compliance with law statements. Starting from the perspective that e-reg documents include what I call statements, okay, you can divide them into two basic categories, statements that are compliance with law statements and statements that aren't compliance with law statements. There's a third category uh, I'll quickly talk about, and those are what I call hard-coded statements. You'll find that, for instance, in when you're doing a discharge, somehow there's a hard-coded statement that's worked its way into the system that says it doesn't contravene the Planning Act, provisions of the uh, part lot control provisions of the Planning Act, which I'm discussing, and, or the Joint Committee is discussing how that got there and why it's there in the first place when it's a complete discharge. So hopefully we can sort of clear that up. Uh, but that's an actual hard-coded statement that's always in the document that you're registering. Getting back to what I was talking about, compliance with law versus other statements, the first thing you have to realize about a compliance with law statement is it has to be made by a lawyer. The theory behind this is that a compliance with law statement involves a legal, conc legal conclusion, someone drawing a legal conclusion that yes, because this and this, therefore this. And that is, is relying on the interpretation of the law. ELPIC has also taken a, p a position that if you rely on compliance with law statements, and they turn out to be wrong, okay, innocently rely on them. Again, the lawyer is not going to be hit with a deductible or uh, the error surcharge levy. Now, in practice, so I've just talked about in theory what a compliance with law statement. In practice, it's difficult to understand how the theory works, to be honest with you, because if you look at a statement, you'll see, boy, that statement looks a lot like a compliance with law statement, when in fact it's not. And you look at another statement and you say, boy, that statement doesn't look like a compliance with law statement, and in fact, it is. Okay, so that's a little bit of the trick to these compliance with law statements. I've set a whole list of compliance with law st statements as one of the appendices. Now, the other thing that I've learned, and, and uh, uh, the person who's talking about compliance with law statements in the context of uh, estate conveyancing later on, I've learned some of these compliance with law statements seem to be overkill okay, or seem to be like redundant and you're saying the same thing twice. And we're looking at some of those and trying to clean some of those problems up at the same time with the ministry. In fact, I was there yesterday looking at some of the estate conveyancing things. The basic system of how they work is you have, you pick from this group, from this group, and from this group, and if you pick one CLA, one compliance law statement from this group, one from this group, and one from this group, you can go forward because the sum of the three statements allows you to have a complete legal conclusion that allows the, the registry office to, in effect, change the registry records based on those legal conclusions. That's typically how they work. So it can be very frustrating because you're trying to figure out which one is the one that's missing. Now, the only help I can give you on that is look at the procedural guide because they do set all the compliance with law statements and, in fact, how they're grouped, which is very important to understand. So, you know, this, these four statements come, are one group and these three are another group, so you select one from there and one from there because when you look at the actual document, they're not that easily grouped. Finally, and most importantly, I, I was hoping to talk a little bit about law clerks and their roles and responsibilities in the, uh, in, in the e-reg world. About six or seven years ago, Kathy Waters prepared a paper, it was called Lawyer and I apologize if I use a football reference, okay, but it's the closest reference I can come to. Lawyers is quarterback of the transactions. And when I thought about it, it came to me that, well, if lawyers are the quarterbacks, and, you, and for those of you who don't understand football, I'll explain it a bit, what are the clerks? And I thought, aha, they're the halfbacks. <laughs> because just like a quarterback who gets all the glory, they take the ball, and the first thing they have to do is figure out who the hell can I get rid of this to as quickly as possible, <laughs> right? And the poor halfback comes running up, and, you, and, and the quarterback says, here, take it, run with it, and go get, a, go get a touchdown, right? Unfortunately, the quarterback doesn't tell you that there's like six 300-pound people that you have to get through to get the touchdown that are ready to kill you, okay? And that's like really, you know, I thought that's what the law clerk gets stuck with, right? Because they're the ones that don't get the glory but have to do all the work and get the deal done and get it closed. Okay? Now, why I'm saying that is because you're going to have the practical, un, a more practical understanding of how this stuff really works, I think it's incumbent upon you to try to stand back and say, I know the trees, let me look at the forest, and let me help my firm understand 
how we're going to deal with electronic registration from a bigger picture perspective, okay? And I'll give you some examples of what I'm talking about. How you're going to work with a document registration agreement. When you're going to try to say you're going to use it. What's the procedure? How's your office going to deal with it? Are you going to use a protocol or an actual agreement? Who's going to sign those things or send out letters confirming that you're ascribing to it? And how's that going to be signed and when's it going to be signed? From a compliance with law perspective, it's going to be incumbent upon you to understand those documents that you absolutely must have CLAs in. So you're not stuck at the last minute scrambling to get a deal closed and trying to find a lawyer who can stick their PSPs in to get those compliance with law statements signed. It's also important to understand from a firm perspective who should be getting access to documents. What's the firm's policy when you're sending documents, messaging them to other sides, who you're going to message them to? The lawyer on the other side? The clerk on the other side? Let's develop some procedures within your office okay, to deal with these types of issues. PSPs, who's going to manage them? Who's going to make sure that they're collected? Who's going to make sure that who, the right people have them? The electronic registration bank account, you've heard that uh, Katarina talk about. What's the best option for an URBA? Is it the special trust account or is it the general trust account from your firm's perspective? You people are the ones that probably have the best answer to these questions and I think it's very important that you step forward, seize the, oppor the huge opportunity that's been presented to you because of the wholesale change in real estate and say, this is how we think this stuff should work and provide your input at this point. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Maurizio. I like that message. That's a message of empowerment here. Excellent. All right. Our next speaker, we're running a little late, but um, you know, we'll, we'll work through it, guys. Not to worry. We'll pick it up in the second half. Our next speaker is Richard Wong. Richard is an associate at Goodman & Carr, working in commercial real estate and development, including condominium law. Richard has talked to us a lot on several occasions. It's great on the ch changes in the Condominium Act. Today, he's going to talk to us about condominium issues in an e-reg context. Richard. Good morning, everybody. I don't know if you heard the latest news, but uh, given that units were found to be sharing common elements, the World Health Organization has issued an e-reg advisory against uh, York and Toronto regions. So <laughs> I don't know how long that's going to last. Bit of a crazy world. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about condominium issues in e-reg and in title searching. And uh, I'm going to hit the highlights of what I talked about in the paper. My paper is really a collection of uh, tips and tools for you because a lot of the stuff is new. In addition to the whole terror view and e-reg mechanism, we have the new Condominium Act. And the purpose of me speaking here today is not to talk about the, what the new forms of condominium are per se, but it's more how to find them because th there have been other conferences on what the new forms are and really I commend you to those materials and uh, the CLE on that because you really have to get a better knowledge as we go forward on how these new condominiums are structured because once you get that, then the searching follows from that. If you don't understand that a common element condominium involves a parcel of land with a pertinent condominium interest, you're going to think, well, maybe I'll just search one thing. But in reality, now you've got two separate pins which comprise your property. So that's just a simple example. So some of the uh, tips that I've tried to raise are more anecdotal and from speaking with law clerks to find out some of the things that they may or may not be aware of or some of the things that some do and wish that everyone else did. So under title searching, uh, my theme there is really don't bow to cost pressures um, because, you know, by cutting corners, et cetera. For example, if you search a dwelling unit and you have uh, two parking units and a locker unit, you know, will everyone pull the parcel for the parking parking and locker unit? I hope so. But when you get to a non-key LRO, that's going to cost you $28 a pin. So 
you know, you, you have to really make sure you adjust your cost expectations and, you know, figure out what your disbursements are going to be in the new regime before you quote it to your client because it's all a matter of expectations. Really, there's no going back and it's a cost of doing business. But you want to make sure that you spend the money and you do it right. For example, if you don't search a parking or locker unit, you may find that there's an undischarged mortgage on there and you don't want to find that out on the day of closing. That would be embarrassing. In other cases I've seen where I've had, uh, had to get involved in cleaning up, you may find that the person who says they own the unit never, never actually got title to it. They, the developer uh, had sold them another unit after they bought the dwelling unit, so like a parking or a locker unit, and maybe the, uh, the transfer was mailed to them and they just filed it away and they never registered it on title. And now it's gone, it's in some box somewhere. And they come to sell and the purchaser requisitions say, the developer is still the owner of that parking unit. And then a big surprise comes up and the next thing you know, the developer's lawyer, if they're tracked down and if you can find the developer, gets a call saying, you know, can you please do an another deed to, you know, to do the conveyance. No one wants to get into that situation because there's no guarantee you're even going to find the developer or the developer's lawyer is going to be around and, you know, that'll hold up your deal. So that's an example. The other example for uh, sort of best practices in searching, make sure you pull a copy of the description plan sheets for the condominium. Obviously that means it's a $15 courier and a $15, you know, pull the, the, the paper charge, but, and that's on top of the searching the, uh, the pins. but. There's no substitute. One of the for um, sorry. There's no substitute for sitting down with your client and saying, "Is that where your unit is?" Because it has happened in the past more than one might think that uh, the unit numbering and the location of the dwelling or the parking or locker unit don't exactly match. And in you know in one out of a hundred cases, um, you know you don't want to be that one. And frankly, probably one out of a hundred lawyers. Uh, maybe search that. I'm not going to give you know, statistics, but when an issue like this comes up, it's amazing that it, it's flown by everybody from the developer side to the purchaser side and people just assumed it corresponded. But when someone actually sat down and looked at it, it didn't correspond. So I suggest that might be a good practice to, to implement. And the other practice is to make sure you pull uh, your pin with deleted instruments. Um, I know the conveyancer at Goodman and Carr I was speaking with today, you know, makes it a standard practice and there's a bunch of good reasons for it. She said to me that uh, there are many times where she sees a, m a discharge of a mortgage that's abstracted on title and, it, it, and then it goes away but the mortgage itself never came off. And I asked her, does that really happen? Because I thought, well, you know, it's got to be a pretty foolproof system because you have to, you know, reference the mortgage number and the discharge, et cetera. But she says, you know, mistakes will happen, human error. And uh, because there are people looking at this and um, because of that, you may find things on title. And instead of going back to try to figure out where that discharge went, why not pull the deleted instruments and just get it done the first time? Now, some people don't want to see all the, the garbage from deleted instruments on there, but you know, with a simple highlight uh, mechanism and getting into it, I, I would suggest that would give you more information off the bat. Um, condominium naming. I've enclosed a schedule uh, put out by TerraView, and it's really helpful when you're going to be doing searches because part of eReg is now you don't have to send the conveyance or hire a local agent anymore uh, in, in many cases. So you can search to the farthest reaches of Ontario. So for the Torontonians, you know, we're used to MTCP, you know, PCP, YRCC, that type of thing. Now you'll see a whole host of other condo naming conventions that you have to get used to. Like in Niagara North, you'll see NNCONPL. Right in Ottawa, Carleton, O C C P N O. You know they're not sort of the average names. And if you have to do a search by condo name in TerraView, it's really handy to have this. So make sure you read the newsletters that come out in TerraView, and it also tells you in the third column the earliest plan available by search of by condominium. That'll change as they uh, put more things on stream. But the point is that by looking at this, you can pretty much figure out how to find a given condominium if you're given the condo number, because you can't always rely on the real estate agents to put it in the offer exactly how it's legally defined. So I think that's, uh, that's a very handy resource. Um, and as far as the naming of the condominiums, and, and that's just the e-reg um, prefixes. Now there's also overlaid on that the new act stuff. Okay, so if I wanted to, you know, get a, a vacant land condominium in Toronto that was just recently registered, I'd be searching, you know, T, S, V, L, 
CC number 103 or something like that, right? You have to start getting used to that just as you've all gotten used to MTCP or TSCC now, as you'll see. But there are vacant land, common element, um, phased and amalgamated condos. Uh, so you have to know how they're named now. There's a bit of a trick there because phased and amalgamated condos don't end up really changing their name uh, to be something special, but you'll see that in the paper. But if you see a common element condo, you've, you've got extra letters in, the, in its name. So if you have a vacant land condo in you know, Ottawa, Carlton region, now you got to tack on the OCCP number and then the VLCC, and it becomes a, a mouthful. And that's really why I'm bringing it to your attention, because you want to just sort of start thinking about combining that, and that becomes a new vocabulary for uh, searching condominiums. Um, <clears throat> so when you look at the, the pins now of these new condominiums, you're going to find, you're going to read the thumbnail description very carefully because they, the land registry offices in Ontario have now gotten on stream uh, quite early on in terms of creating new conventions on what the parcels should say. For example, if you buy into a common element condo, you're going to read the thumbnail description for the mainlands. To, just to make an example, you'll have your house and you'll have a shared roadway, okay? So the shared roadway is part of the common element condo and you've got the house being uh, sort of what the parcel of land and there's other houses that also share into that condo. So you'll search on the house and you'll see on the parcel for the house, it'll say, you know, house, et cetera, together with a common uh, interest, an undivided common interest in Toronto Common Element Condominium Corporation number three. Okay, so that already, it's almost like an, a pertinent easement in a way, right? You've got to sort of pay attention to that easement now, and there will be a remark in, on the parcel that says, for additional encumbrances, the pin for Toronto Common Element Condominium Corporation number so-and-so should be examined. Okay, that is your flag to say, oh, I gotta go to the pin for the condo now. Because on the house that you search, you're not gonna see the declaration, you're not gonna see the bylaws. That is on the, uh, that's gonna be on the condominium parcel. Okay, so you have to flip there, unless of course there's a, a, uh, a lien for common expenses, and that would pop on, not on the condominium parcel, but on the house. And since when have you searched the house with a common expense lien? Well, welcome to common element condos. Okay, in the paper I also talk about some of the new instruments that you'll see now searching the various new condos, like in a, in the, um, a leasehold condo, you'll see a ground lease and you'll see an amendment. So pull all of that because that's, again, fundamental to the type of condo it is. Um, I don't really have time to go into all of that, but it should be self-explanatory. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is the coordination issues on closing from a developer's point of view. A lot of you have been involved in buying from a developer and you know they can be very, very strict. How's that? Because from their end, they run their show like a military operation. You've got to close 300 units in one day or four days or whatever it is. And from that point of view, you know everything's got to have its own procedures. So one thing, just uh, I'm going to give two comments really to, to end this off is that developers' lawyers have been finding that they, you know, they, they check everything and then they sign all the deeds, okay? And then, bef and this is before closing, they don't wait to the minute of closing, but they sign it for completeness, let's say, and they'll sign it for release as things close. For completeness, after they signed it, you know, they're happy, they're moving on to the next stage, and then they go back to check, and they find that the, their signature is gone. Why is that? Because uh, maybe the purchaser's lawyer logged in and maybe they clicked the planning act statement. You know, in a condominium, you know, you don't really need the planning act statement because the condominium itself has got the planning act consent and that's all right. But if, if you tick it off, uh, then that removes a vendor's signature. Same thing for the land transfer tax affidavit. If that's filled in, um, that erases a signature. And that's how the system is not designed to work. And I'm, and I'm saying as a coordination matter, it would be good if those things were at least uh, thought about before the vendor signed it. Otherwise, all it means is that the vendor's lawyer has to pull it out, figure out what went on, and it's going to delay your closing. And if you, God forbid, on the purchaser side have more than one deal, you know, you don't, you don't want anything to get in the way of that. So that's the purchaser side uh, comment. And from the vendor side comment, you know, after you register the condominium, you uh, have all these instruments that you have to put on, bylaws and you know, uh, development agreements and assumption agreements. And as a courtesy, because if you put them on like too close to final closing, then purchasers, lawyers are all uh, sort of caught at the last minute seeing all these new uncertified documents and you don't know what they are, so you've got to pull them at the last minute. To the extent that you can as a condo developer, make sure you give as many of the documents that you've, you're registered, or at least going to register uh, beforehand, so that way no one's surprised on closing. So that's it for my uh, talk, and I will commend you to the coffee break. Uh, 
Uh, condominiums have always been a unique beast, and uh, automation and e-reg have uh, just added to the complexities. So, uh, Richard, we very much appreciate your practice issues. Uh, we're running a little bit behind, as you can see, and so we'd like to shorten the uh, coffee break to just under 15 minutes. And if you could all try to be back by about 11.30, uh, then we'll continue with our comprehensive program. Thank you.